second day of the Spring College. I think uh, we are ready to start. Okay. David, the uh, floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so again, I'd like to emphasize to everybody, this is um, I'm learning while you're learning, and um, to help both of us be learning, so to do this for me, don't do it, never mind for you, ask questions all the time. Give me feedback, you're going too fast, you're putting me to sleep, you're going so slowly, whatever, everything like that, all information is good information. If you're a good Bayesian, you can just ignore data at the worst case. So anyway, um, okay, so, uh, in retrospect, actually, I'm not sure maybe today's lecture should have gone before yesterday's. They sort of go together. Yesterday, um, uh, Gil Jashi um, reviewed information theory. Um, so just to present you a bunch of mathematical tools. But in a certain sense, there's still, in a very real sense, there's still the question, why do we care about information theory? Why do we even care about probability theory, for that matter, if we're doing physics? Schrodinger's equation... Um, the Born rules got probability theory, but actually if you adhere to the church of Everett, uh, many worlds, of which I am a card-carrying member, by the way, then there's not even really probability, even in the Born rule in quantum mechanics. No probability of general relativity. What the hell is this probability crap that we're forced to learn along with all these other things when we are undergraduates and so on and so forth? Why even probabilities in the first place? So... Um, I'm going to start by actually giving a set of arguments. They're still controversial, these in the literature, but there's a bunch of arguments that actually say that according to very, very simple desiderata, you actually have no choice but to use probability theory to quantify uncertainty. I will then give other kinds of first principles arguments to say, oh, and if you just want a single number, a single real number, that's going to capture and quantify the amount of uncertainty you do have, which we just determined was in terms of probability theory. What do you want to use? And those arguments say entropy. And then I'm going to finally say, um, talk a little bit about Bayesian statistics, and then say, OK, we decide we want to use probability theory. We decide we want to quantify things with uncertainty. How is it that we should actually say, here is my amount of uncertainty about the system, what is my best guess for the actual state of the system? And by doing that, with no discussion at all about heat baths or any of that other kind of weird stuff, nothing about ergodic theory, which, by the way, between you and me is not very pleasant stuff, um, without any of that, derive all statistical physics. And that's basically Ed Jane's 1957 paper. It's a beautiful paper. Two papers I've indirectly referenced. First, Everett's Many Worlds paper. It was actually his PhD thesis. It's something like 15 pages long in physical review. It's very easy to read. And it basically solves a whole bunch of problems that people at the time weren't even really sure how to think about. That's one. And then this other one, the 1957 paper by uh, Ed James. OK, so on we go. In many physical scenarios, arguably in every single physical scenario, um, we, it's kind of strange not to be looking up at my screen. Um, I can get risky and try this. In many physical scenarios, um, we don't actually know all of the details about the relevant laws of, we know um, all the laws of physics, or at least we think we do. We're cocky physicists, we know everything, we know the laws of physics. But if I give you a particular physical situation in front of you, you will not know all of the parameters to infinite precision. That's almost axiomatically true. I mean, it's obvious. Um, or at least you can say at a minimum, what's that stupid sign saying? At a minimum, that's very, very often true. Um, so we are uncertain in particular about the initial state of any system. We know that's dynamic laws, but we're uncertain about its initial state. So well, what do we do? We are physics grad students. Da -da 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 -da. The only thing that we know how to do in life is physics, it seems. We've done nothing else for the past six, seven, eight years. And we'll need nothing else, to be quite honest, for the next many, many years. So that's the only thing we know how to do. We don't have a life. You know, we're not human beings. We're physicists. And all we know how to do is physics. 
We know the laws of physics, but we don't know the initial states to plug into our brilliant brains to calculate the future. What do we do? We're stuck. We're physicists. We've got to be able to calculate, but how do we calculate? Okay. So, um, what we, so what we need to be able to do is um, figure out how to do physics when you have what's called uncertainty. All right. Um, so the first thing we've got to do is figure out how to quantify that uncertainty. So one natural thing to think is that we have a function over all the, oops, that's not right. Um, sorry, it's the first time using this pointer. We have a function from all the possible events, all the possible values of the parameters and so on and so forth to the real numbers. Um, what do we want that function to be? This is a way of trying to mathematize this question of how do we deal with uncertainty. And now as I'm going to be, I'm saying, as I'm going to be demonstrating or sketching, there's many s different sets of desiderata that all say to use the axioms of probability theory, Komogorov's um, uh, axioms of probability theory. If people don't know what those axioms are, if they don't know what a sigma algebra is and things like this, all these fancy, very, very mathy, cool sounding words, I'm just Wikipedia. It is very, very simple concepts. It's, it's several to zeterata about intersections, unions, real valued functions, and so on. And they basically are derived as a way to deal with uncertainty. And I'm going to um, sketch out a little bit of that. Um, these are some arguments that actually um, went back to Ramsey, Frank Ramsey of Ramsey Numbers. A, um, I believe he was a British Don. Um, very, very smart guy. Um, uh, but in any case, one of the things he did, it's almost like a Fermat's last theorem. A throwaway comment he made, I'm not sure if it was in a book or not, um, turned out to be a very subtle thing to prove and is still argued about today. Um, but uh, perhaps the canonical starting point for these arguments is a Definiti's Dutch book argument. So first, um, what is a Dutch book? A Dutch book means, this is a strange kind of a setup. A Dutch book is a set of bets, um, odds and stakes between an agent and a bookie, between you and me, I'm the bookie, you're the agent, about some possible events, for example, the state of a system. And a Dutch book such set of odds and stakes means that I, the bookie, it's not that I'm going to make money from you under expectation or something like that, because that's already assuming the axioms of probability theory. It's rather no matter how the world turns out, I make money off of you. I forget why that's called a Dutch book, per se. But in any case, this is something that I very much want to have, and you want to avoid at all costs. OK? So. Um, let's assume that the uh, age, so what the, the way the argument's going to go is that if you ahead of time as, um, assign probabilities, odds, to the series of possible events which violate any of the axioms of probability theory, I can design a Dutch book against you such that, well, if you're truthfully saying these are what your odds are, so you accept a gamble based upon this Dutch book. I make money, and you lose money. So therefore, if you don't want to become even more impoverished than all grad students are, you must use probability theory. OK. So let's, I'm not going to actually prove it. The proof um, is a little uh, tedious, but I'll go through giving some uh, illustrations of it. So, um, and it's, it's an if and only if. So conversely, if you actually present probabilities that are consistent with the laws of probability theory, sorry, if you present odds on the possible events that are consistent with the laws of probability, in that case, there is no Dutch book that I, the bookie, can make against you. So it's an if and only if. All right, so here is an example. I'm not, as I say, I'm not going to go through the details. It's a lot of just testing different cases and showing how to do things. But this is an example of a Dutch book. So in this particular case, um, we are talking about a uh, possible events are which horse wins a race. That's what we're betting on. So it's like this is a physical system with four states. You can think of it that way. Um, but for us, it's a horse winning a race. Um, uh, there's going to be odds that you say ahead of time. And I'm going to take those odds, and they're going to violate probability theory in this particular case by, by summing to greater than 1. Since you are giving me those odds, 
I'm going to design a Dutch book, which since you believe those odds, that's kind of an assumption with things that philosophers argue, but since you believe those odds, you will take this series of bets that I offer you, and the end result's going to be that I make money, no matter what the actual, who, which horse actually wins. Because you're violating this particular axiom probability theory about summing to one. So, um, again, maybe I should just do it this way. So let's say that these are the odds um, that, uh, you that you place on the horses. Um, even odds, in other words, your probability you sign to horse one winning is 0.5. You think the probability of horse two winning is a quarter, and so on and so forth. You are violating the axioms of probability theory because you're saying that the sum over all events, or the probability of the events, is greater than one. It is difficult to talk through these things. Um, so um, what we're going to do is I, the bookie, am going to then be designing a set of these. These are the bets. You will accept them all. And the end result is going to be that um, because you accept all of these bets and you have to put in some money to a bet, I give you money back depending on whether it happens. So for example, in this one right here, um, uh, the bet price, we just lost the, oh, I see. The bet price is 100. Um, uh, if horse one wins, then I give you back that 100 plus 100. Otherwise, I just keep the 100. Here, because of the way the odds are, um, you give me 50. But because of it's a, a 3 to 1, um, the, st the uh, odds here, if, I, if that horse wins, horse 2, I give you back 150. And you would accept all these given that you say these are the odds. OK? So for example, right here, as I say, um, you will be giving me then a total up front, because you're making these four bets. You give me, the bookie, a total of 210. I guess these should be euros. Um, presumably, I couldn't find euros on the fonts, whatever. So you give me 210 euros. And here's the four possible events. If horse one wins, you get back 200 euros, the 100 uh, that you gave for that particular um, bet plus the 100 because that horse wins. Here is, again, 200 you give back, 200, 200. So no matter what happens, you end up um, uh, getting back 200, but you gave me a total of 210 because there were four events. And so in this way, um, no matter what reality is, because the odds that you um, uh, agreed to, the odds that you told me were true because they violated this particular axiom of probability theory, I make money off of you no matter what happens. So this is not making money under expectation. This is making money no matter what the state of the world is. OK? So we can um, elaborate this kind of reasoning and simplify it a little bit. Um, so here's a, um, a reasonable argument um, for if there's a case of well, one possible event that can be true or false. So the, um, remember the way that it's going. Um, uh, the agent, you give me QS ahead of time. Q is the odds. S is the stake. And uh, if it's true, then um, I give you back um, uh, 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 S minus QS, which is what the amount that you gave me. And if it's false, then the payoff um, to the agent, um, uh, you lose. It's minus QS. OK? Because you receive nothing if it's false. So in this particular case, um, uh, we walk it through. The reason that um, the expected amount to you, um, if the probability of E actually is Q, so this is why you would accept the gamble, is because if those were actually the odds, the reason you'd accept this is because you think it's fair. And so we can throw little epsilons in so that we can um, establish that actually you would like this because you think that your average payoff is going to be greater than 0. OK? So it's a fair bet if the probability of E actually were Q. So you would accept it um, if Q were that particular probability that you um, believe. So therefore, you would also offer it to me, going back the other way, um, uh, for some, uh, for if you, you would offer me the bet at a particular P of A E that you think is actually true. OK, so um, uh, let's say that in this particular case, the axiom of probability theory you're going to be violating is that P of E equals true is actually less than 0. 
Okay, so it's not a matter of adding up to one. In this case, there's an axiom probability theory saying that every event has a non-negative value probability. In that particular case, um, rather than um, uh, my buying, rather than your buying bets from me, I will buy bets from you that you would offer me because you think these stakes are legitimate. And as we, if we walk it through through the table here, the payoff in this case to me is going to be S minus um, uh, P of E, what you think, times S. If it's false, um, because if you look at the table right here, you believe P of E. So this is what would be true for um, any Q. That's the way that the um, book would go. You believe that actually Q equals P of E. So in this particular case, um, the payoff to me, in this case, I'm the bookie, because we flipped around who's the bookie and who's the agent, would be minus P E of S. And so if you look at this, because um, uh, P of E is less than zero, I actually end up making money no matter what happens. Because you did this weird thing of saying the probability of an event is less than zero. So this, one's less, this particular example of what happens if you violate an axiom of probability theory is less intuitive than the example where um, everything sums up to greater than one. But it basically follows by the fact that for fair odds, this is actually a book that um, you, the agent, would be willing to um, either sell or buy. So to deal with this case where, where you're actually um, uh, offering a book with odds are less than zero, we're flipping around who buys and who sells. Using this right here, we set up the rules for the payoffs. And therefore, I win again. OK? So are these kinds of arguments, um, different A's Dutch book arguments, is the kind of reasoning here clear? OK, good. Um, let's see what's on this one. Do, 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 do. Yep, so this is the other probability. So bookie wins. Mm -hmm. OK, so this is just going through what I pretty much said. Um, so you can continue this for all the actions of probability theory. So there's other things called Cox's axioms, there's many different ways of establishing this kind of reasoning, saying that um, uh, we are uncertain about the state of the system, in the case of Dutch book arguments, um, and if our goal is to not lose money, Cox's axioms are different. There's different kinds of axioms people have um, come up with. We must actually use Komogorov's axiom that axiomatization of probability theory. OK. So um, uh, what are some of the implications of those axioms of probability theory? So um, uh, we just established, yes, use probability theory. Now I'm going to just do something that's a um, rather, oh, I don't know what the word is. I certainly don't know what the word is this early in the morning. But um, a take what's actually just a standard definition and make it more grandiose by giving it, uh, calling it a theorem. Some, this is called Bayes' theorem. And all it is is a, set of, is a definition right here. This is derivation of it. The, um, the conditional probability of A given B, by definition, is the joint probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. That, um, just using this definition of conditional probability again, is going to be P of A times P of B given A over P of B. Matteo? We have a Yes. We have a question on, uh, on Zoom uh, by Michele. Is there an example like the one before on horses where P is uh, less than zero, where P is negative? Um, yes, you can set up the exact same kind of a reasoning. I reduced, I tried to illustrate that there are various ways of formalizing the precise betting scenario by going from four horses to simply true false. But you can, do the, you can um, run through the same kind of argument. Um, in this particular case, the Scholarpedia page is actually better than the uh, Wikipedia page. And um, just to um, uh, answer from a larger sociological context, what is argued about with Dutch book arguments um, uh, these days by philosophers are questions like, well, um, why is it that an um, agent would have to do this um, I can imagine an agent who, yes, believes certain odds, 
but I just don't want to do anything. I might not have any money to be doing any gambling at all. So those are the kinds of arguments people make mm -hmm. um, these days. But yes, you can do it in terms of horses as well. OK. OK. All right. So um, base theorem. So if you start with um, uh, the, uh, what's called the posterior P of A given B, if you know um, uh, this right here, um, what's called the prior P of A, then you can um, flip things around and you can get then um, uh, P of B given A. Crucial thing to notice here is that P of B, you can calculate it just by normalization. If I sum, um, strap doesn't want to stay on. If I sum up the right-hand side um, over uh, all B, over all A rather, I will get P of B. So all that I need, and that, so as long as I know this particular expression here for all A and B, um, then I know P of A given B. So this is a way that you can derive P of A given B from P of B given A and the prior P of A. And this is called Bayes' theorem. Um, in point of fact, the person who really did most of the work with it is Laplace. Um, it should be called Laplace's theorem. He did some of the first calculations concerning planetary motion and so on. He used Bayes' theorem um, throughout all those calculations and really introduced a lot of very powerful, important tools for using Bayesian statistics. Um, just a little bit of history. At the end of the 19th century, um, the devil is in the details, and the details are in the prior. At the end of the 19th century or so, people started to come up with really stupid priors, without getting into the formalization of how you can tell priors are stupid or smart. And it's garbage in, garbage out. So they got very, very stupid results, predictions, using Bayes' theorem. It fell into disrepute. And that, what actually, that is what actually um, led to what's called sampling theory statistics. Fisher, who right now is somebody whose name you're not supposed to talk about because he was a racist pig. But anyway, Fisher, um, Wright, and many others um, uh, hypothesis testing, p-hacking, all of that traces back to Fisher. There were still huge wars about Bayesian versus non-Bayesian throughout the 20th century. And by this point, I think people are pretty much just tired of it and uh, use whatever works which, and whatever their uh, personal preferences. So anyway, that's a little bit of the background to the history of Bayes' theorem. Um, uh, let's see uh, what some of the implications of Bayes' theorem are. Let's plug in for these uh, generic A's and B's. Let's see that, say, that some particular event, like the state of a system, um, and you have some data concerning the state of the system. And in this case, as I mentioned, this is called the posterior probability. It's proportional to the prior times this, which is called the likelihood. Notice that this is right here. That's describing your observational apparatus. That's your experimental apparatus, saying that if this event actually did happen, in my experiment, the probability that the data I get out would have been given by um, this conditional right here. This is your prior probability of what the events could have been. And this is what you're actually interested in. Um, according to all the rules of probability theory that we just talked about, that's um, probability of event given data. All right. So given Bayes' theorem, let's say you want to actually come up with just a single prediction. I don't want to know this probability over an event. I've actually got to, let's say, predict the specific single event to do that, um, that I think happened given my data. There's two important concepts that I'm, there are several important concepts, but one of them is what I will refer to um, It's called the MAP event, the maximum a posteriori. This is actually the rule, if you want to call it that, saying um, simply predict that the event happened is the one whose posterior probability given your data, is the largest. That's called the MAP one. And basically, physics is based upon MAP reasoning. Statistical physics is based upon MAP reasoning. Um, now, an important point to bear in mind about all of this, as for getting to statistical physics, is that all of this is true when you're also, even when we're talking about probabilities of probabilities. These are called hyperprobabilities, hyperpriors, things like that. So in particular, here's an example. Suppose you have a Gaussian, so that's your probability distribution. But you could actually have more than one Gaussian. Um, you're not certain about what its mean is. So if you are uncertain about its mean, you um, can have a probability distribution over the means of the Gaussian 
will be a probability over probabilities. It will be a hyperprobability. So once you actually specify a hyperprior, a prior over the means, we can then actually give you the prior, we can give you the posterior probability of a particular mean, and we can then just integrate it through. So if we want to actually pre um, predict one particular sample from that um, uh, Gaussian, we can get it by um, uh, just integrating over the prior, if in this particular case we had no actual data, no samples of the Gaussian. Okay? All right. Now, um, the MAP, it's kind of uh, makes sense, but it itself is not really motivated by any kinds of desiderata. So um, is there some set of desiderata that we could use that actually does um, end up with a very, very um, uh, well-founded rule for, giving, for turning any probability distribution into a prediction of what single event happened? And the answer is yes. There are various ways of doing this. One of them is a fellow called um, Savage. Um, he has a bunch of um, axioms that basically say that you need to add something to your probability distribution to actually uniquely specify what is the proper, what's called the Bayes optimal prediction you should make based on the probability distribution. And that's called the loss function, which, by the way, plays a role very, very similar to the distortion function that Gurdjieff was talking about yesterday. And the loss function, it basically says that if you predict x prime, but the truth is actually x, then, th then you end up paying the loss function. It's a map from x and x prime to the real numbers. You want to minimize loss. So according to Savage's axioms, and more precisely, what you want to do is choose the x prime that minimizes your expected loss. This is called Bayes optimal. And you can have posterior expected loss when these are um, uh, all posterior probabilities and so on. Um, there's lots of very important consequences of this, of, of sort of um, rules of thumb that you know already. One of them is let's say that you have quadratic loss. So if you predict x prime, the truth is x, and uh, then what you must pay is the square difference between x and x prime. If you've got any distribution p over x, your optimal guess in this case is actually the average. In general, bear in mind that if it's not a quadratic loss, which is kind of a funny thing to accept, it means that if I double the amount that I'm off, I have to pay four times as much. And I guess there are some physical scenarios where that's true, but there's certainly many where there's not. If that is not your loss function, in general, you should not predict the average. So for example, let's say your loss function is the absolute value of the difference between x and x prime, which in some senses makes more sense. You would think that that actually is reasonable in more situations. Does anybody have a prediction from based upon, in essence, sociology of what it might be the Bayes optimal prediction based of a probability distribution if actually your loss function is just the absolute value? Can you predict what the answer is for what you should predict? Sorry? Yeah. And the median actually has many more stable properties than does the mean in many situations. If you have long tail distributions and things like this, it's famous that the median is going to be um, less sensitive to those very, very rare events than the mean is. And in part, that can be um, um, reflected, that comes from ultimately the uh, choice of the loss function. Similarly, if anybody here has done things like machine learning, there's what are called regularization penalties in uh, many neural net training algorithms. Um, one of them that was way back in the day called weight decay is basically a quadratic loss on the weights of your network. If you instead impose an L1 loss, the the, um, your penalty is given by the magnitude of the weights. Now you've actually got, um, because of things that are called like, like shrinkage priors and so on, you end up with a sparse code, and it tends to perform much, much better. So all of these things are wrapped up. There's all of machine learning is down that door coming out of these kinds of issues. And of course, there are other situations where you wouldn't want absolute value. Very, very often, you would want chronic or delta. If I don't actually get the exact prediction correct, then I'm screwed. But if I get it correct, then I'm fine. It doesn't matter if I'm off, 
being off is all the same. Then you actually go back to, can anybody guess? To what the optimal prediction is for a chronic or delta loss function? To minimize the expected loss, so let's go back. Um, where to go? Yes, we wanted to minimize this right here where the loss function is delta x comma x prime. Bang. Give the man a free coffee or whatever else it is that you uh, most desire. For me, this time of day, it's free coffee. But in any case, my loss function is very high for any other kind of liquid. Um, but yes, in this particular case, it's going to be the MAP that's going to be coming out. OK? So in any case, um, here is a really fun example. Um, so David, uh, yes? So in the end, the choice of a loss function is essentially, I mean, is it the choice of a prior? No, they, well, they are related. Bec yes. Okay. I mean, if you, if you think about the regularization, the example you, you said. Yes, you so can... I was conflating things. You're correct. Um, well, properly speaking, I was just cheating a little bit. Um, what's called regularization setting the Bayesian prior, that does not necessarily involve a loss function per se. But they have relations. They, the, the two of them affect one another. So I actually conflated two concepts there. What I was actually giving when I was talking about neural nets is what uh, Matteo is going after here. Um, Dr. Marsili, I guess, Professor Marsili. Um, uh, in that particular case, um, the things that I was describing about are actually the priors. If you adopt a Bayesian perspective, Non-Bayesians, people in the Fisher School would call them the regularization penalties. It wasn't exactly the same thing as a loss function, but the prior that you choose is related to the loss function um, in certain ways. So yeah, very good point. Thank you for um, emphasizing that. Yep, I was sloppy. Um, um, my bad. Um, but so here's a kind of a cool um, example. This goes back to Laplace, actually. Um, People here, um, how many days, pick anybody. Um, you've already had your cup of coffee. Should I just pick on people? Somebody else come up with a number, and there's no way I'm going to tell you you're wrong, for how many times that you have seen the sun rise in the morning? Somebody come up with a number. I don't know your age, so you just tell me. Everybody is so shy. Um, Let's just say, um, I don't know, 300. Let's say that you're 20 years old or 30 years old or something like that. Whatever. Let's say you've seen it come up 5,000 times. Uh, make it 1,000 because actually very often you sleep in. So you've seen the sun come up 1,000 times. You've done the experiment 1,000 times. View 1,000 times. So let's say that the sun rising every day is a biased coin. It's a random event. It either can come up or it could not come up someday. It would be really unfortunate if it didn't come up, but a priori, you've only got direct evidence. Your data is only having seen it rise a thousand times in a thousand experiments. If you toss a um, coin twice and both times comes up heads, you're not going to conclude that it's heads. You're going to conclude that there's some distribution over heads. And that's true no matter how many times you see it come up. There's this other body of work called no free lunch theorems that say that's actually true about everything you do in life, and there are lots of consequences, but we don't need to go in that. But so let's just talk about the sun rising. And we want to um, ask the question, what is your best prediction, your Bayes optimal prediction, for whether the sun will rise again tomorrow? OK, we can do that. So we've got a coin with some probability of heads. Um, and in our particular case, the data is that we have tossed it, say, a 1,000 times, and all, and all 1,000 in our particular case, it came up heads. Let's say we're using quadratic loss. If it's a fair coin, and if every single sample of this coin is independent, if they're IID, if it's not a Markov process, and so on and so forth, we can just plug it into all of this. And what we get is what's called Laplace's Law of Succession, which says that your Bayes optimal prediction for whether the sun comes up tomorrow is the number of heads you saw divided by the total number of experiments, sorry, plus one divided by the total number of experiments plus two. 
So as you would expect, it's less than one. In this particular case, we're talking about 1,001 over 1,002. Okay? In general, the way that this goes is if the, your coin can have a total of um, R plus um, uh, possible values rather than just two, that comes up in these numbers. That's R minus one, and that's just R, and so on and so forth. We can also use this kind of reasoning to do other things. Like, for example, let's say I've got some data, and I don't want to know something like what is um, the uh, probability of a heads value. Let's say, for example, I want to know some characteristic of the distribution that I think was sampled repeatedly to give me the data. Yes? Can I ask why did you use the quadratic plot? I mean, oh, no, no particular reason. Um, go ask the plot. <laughs> um, I also, not only a quadratic loss, but also a uniform prior. So this is a prior over prior. So this is a hyper prior. And we're saying that a priori, the probability that my coin has bias z, where z is a number between 0 and 1, it's uniform over all possible z's. So therefore, with that prior and uh, this particular data, I can get a posterior. I can normalize it. And if I happen to use quadratic loss, this is what comes out. If I don't use quadratic loss, if I use absolute value loss, I'll get a different result. I would get the median, and, and offhand, I don't know what the median is, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and let's say in this case, I will get also really a number really close to one. Also, I mean, there is not too much. Um, the loss function, well, it, hmm. uh, for loss functions that you and I just talking um, off the cuff considered to be reasonable, yes. But if you were to try to formalize, what is the space of possible loss functions, and how do we say what the reasonable loss functions are? You'll have a more difficult time. But when we're just sitting around, I'm drinking way too much of this coffee. Um, yeah, we'll agree that for any reasonable loss function, in this particular case, you, end up with, you would end up with a number very, very close to one. You're correct. OK? Um, but let's say that we can examine this case again. It's a binary coin. Binary coins have for, um, the, we can have functions of the probability distribution. For example, yesterday Gilja was talking about entropy, which we'll get to in a second. So let's say the exact same data. I want to actually, what I want to know is what do I think the entropy of the distribution is that gave this? So I'm not asking to make a single prediction. I'm asking to know what the entropy is. And to do that, I hate chalk, by the way, but in any case, um, uh, what you would do is you would write down that the expected entropy given the data um, up to proportionality constants and so on, that's going to be um, integral over all possible probability distributions. Since we have a finite number of events, in this case we have two, notice that this probability distribution is just a real vector. In this case, it's a vector in R2 that has, happens to live in a simplex. It always has to live in a unit simplex. So we're going to have this. And then we're going to have the posterior. And we were just saying things like we can have it be a uniform prior over P, in which case this would be proportional to probability of P of Z given P, which would equal the product over all of our M experiments of the D um, datum. So this will give you the posterior expected estimate of your entropy given your finite amount of data. You can, by similar reasoning, you can actually get variances in the entropy given the data and so on and so forth. And there's a very, very subtle issue um, here is how do you want to choose a prior in general? Um, uh, I was actually involved with, um, uh, well, actually, the very first paper that wrote down this equation. But um, some of the more sophisticated recent work is by a fellow called Poole, P-O-O-L-E. -O 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 He's at Princeton, actually, in um, cognitive science or something like that. But um, it's based upon what's called Chinese restaurant priors, so very, very funky kind of stuff. Um, but that's the um, for how to set the priors. This also becomes a lot of subtleties. This is very much of an aside. But there become a lot of subtleties of what you want to do, for example, is let's say your data concerns variables with have two indices. And you want to know what the mutual information is. 
between those associated values. So what I want to know is what is the posterior expected mutual information given data. In that particular case, it actually depends upon which formula you use for what mutual information is. If you actually decompose mutual information, uh, yesterday, for example, we saw mutual information written as the uh, relative entropy, the KL divergence. That's one way to write it, and just plug it into the definitions of this. But there are other ones which, in our, up in our world, are all the same. If I actually know my distributions, this equals that. But if you try to estimate it from data, you're going to get a different answer depending on which of these formulas you use. So which one should you use? And here, let's make it even more interesting. Let's say there's other arguments that you, d but you don't even know how many there are. So you're only seeing probability distribution over some of the actual values. There are hidden values. What do you do then? Turns out there are ways to deal with all that kind of stuff. Um, it's not actually Bayes optimal, but it is other uses of Bayes theorem. So is this related to the fact that uh, the I mean, the average over the data of the, I mean, the empirical uh, entropy computed from empirical distribution uh, is not an efficient, uh, is not, is, an unbi is a biased estimator of the entropy. Oh, but, okay, so bias and variance, those are sampling theory statistics. Um, there is, well, better be careful here. That's not the very, very mainstream Bayesian reasoning, which is what I presented here, there is nothing like bias and variance. You don't care about bias. You care about minimizing expected loss. It actually turns out you can make a midway framework that lies in between sampling theory statistics, which is where bias variance lives, and full Bayesian. You can, in essence, have a Bayesian version of bias variance. And there, um, there's lots of rich results, but this doesn't care at all about bias. Um, and in particular, bias would do things like, if you wanted the unbiased estimate you were saying, the frequency counts, if there happened to be some bins, some values that I never saw, I would assign them zero probability and evaluate the entropy based upon that. That um, is clearly a little bit pathological. You do a Bayesian analysis, and you're never going to actually conclude that the probability of any one particular event is exactly zero with certainty, you'll be allowing for the slop. And so in general, you will actually get different answers for this kind of a um, calculation than you would if you were to do it with a frequentist unbiased estimator, um, worrying about the other higher terms in the bias as well, which is what people normally do. Is that? Yeah, yeah. So, so I was wondering whether this problem is related to the fact that S of P is not a linear function of P. You mean this P. right here? Yeah. Um, it's really just much more a matter of the fact that you can write this out in two different ways. We could work it through. This right here is going to be the entropy of P, like this. It's going to then be the cross entropy. And when we do the cross entropy for this kind of a calculation, because this is not a delta function, you will get something different from if you just look at the conditional distribution. That's the kind of thing. So it's not so much a matter of frequentist or not, it's just the fact that we can write this in uh, various different ways. And so, for example, um, uh, quantum thermodynamics, you actually have relative entropy. Is, has to be represented in different ways because you don't know what it means to have a conditional, to have a relative um, kolbach labor divergence. Um, you have to write differently from the standard formula that, for example, was presented yesterday because you can't talk about cleanly one probability divided by another one inside of a logarithm. So instead, people break up and use another similar um, uh, formula equivalent formula for relative entropy, and that's what you have to do in quantum thermo, which is another example of where you have to use a different formula. And so therefore, in quantum thermo, if you try to do the exact same thing of estimating um, von Neumann entropy given data, it would depend, von Neumann relative entropy given data, it would depend upon which definition of relative entropy you used. Um, uh, such as life, and that's actually part of what we learn by formalizing all these kinds of issues. Okay, so 
moving right along. Um, is this pace too slow, too fast? What do people think? About right? Or Goldilocks? OK, cool. Um, it's too fast, so there is a way to slow this down yeah. by making questions, asking questions. Yep, yep. Um, notice like what I was saying um, yesterday. The people who know things, they're the ones who are the asking questions, and they're the ones that are impressing those who matter, and it's the professors. You guys want to learn how to be that. If you want to learn how to be a professor, you've got to learn how to be a rude asshole who asks questions all the time, because that's the only way you're going to learn. Some, some kind of a good bumper sticker about um, if you want to learn, you've got to be an asshole. Anyway, um, OK. So let's say we just um, uh, determined that you have to use probability distributions. And we also, though, that there are going to be many situations related to what we were just talking about here where I say, fine, I've got, here's the probability distribution. I came up with it with Bayes' optimal reasoning, or I was just given it by God or some such. How do I actually quantify the amount of uncertainty in that probability distribution? So here's one way to answer that question. We've got a probability distribution over um, uh, all these events, um, x1, x2, and so on. These are going to be su successive samples of some uh, random variable x. So this is with the first sample, the second sample. We want um, a function, which is going to be quantifying our uncertainty, which says that the, um, uh, in this case, we're going to be looking, we're looking for a function that we're calling the surprise. The surprise in a sequence x1, x2, we want to be a surprise in um, x1 plus the surprise in x2. So I'm not going to start by directly quantifying uncertainty. I'm going to instead be using an intuitive concept of surprise. This is an argument that traces back to uh, Jane's, actually. So um, let's say that what we want to, our desideratum is that the surprise in a sequence, two events, x1 followed by x2, what's your total surprise at seeing those two events, given that you know what the underlying distribution p is? I want it to just be additive. It's the surprise I saw in the first one plus the surprise I saw in the second one. Also require that this function, the surprise function, it's decreasing as a function of its argument. That the greater the probability of an event the less my surprise in actually seeing that event. OK? If you put these together, what you will find is that your surprise function, um, uh, modulo some extra um, arbitrary constants, it's given by a logarithm. You can change the base of the logarithm, but that's what it is uniquely. OK? So now that we know what the surprise of a single event is, drawn from a probability distribution, well, I know that probability distribution hard to say that fast, probability distribution by assumption, because we just talked about the surprise in it. So I can very reasonably say, well, let's um, uh, just wink and nod, expected loss, so we want to look at the mean, so expected quadratic, sorry, quadratic loss, so we want to look at the expected value of the surprise. What is the expected surprise? Bang, entropy. Okay. So here's an example of this kind of reasoning. Um, suppose that you have a Gaussian with univariance. Remember that we had the hyperprior before. Um, suppose that now there's n plus. So this was an example of, um, hmm, sorry, let me back it up a second. Over here, we just showed that the proper way that you want to quantify the uncertainty in the distribution is the entropy of it. Because you just take the um, average of this according to p of x, and what you're going to be getting is um, uh, negative the integral of p of x log p of x. So that's the amount of uncertainty in a distribution. OK? Now, step two, going through this a little bit more slowly, apologies. Let's, using that, say I want to actually predict what my distribution is. So we're quantifying the uncertainty in a distribution by its entropy. Now I've got data like something along these lines, and I want to be able to predict my distribution here. So I need a prior over distributions. This is, remember, what an example of that 
for the case where we were talking about real valued underlying variables. But now let's be look, considering just the case where we've got a finite number of possible values of our random variable so that the distribution is just a finite dimensional real number. And we want to have a prior probability over that real number so that we can say something like, what is my posterior Bayes optimal expected um, optimal prediction for the distribution that generates some data based upon that data? Okay, this would be the kind of prior that goes into here. Well, and here's another um, um, uh, somewhat axiomatic piece of reasoning. We just said that the uncertainty in a distribution is given by its entropy. So, one natural choice, and I'm not going to try to go further right, um, right now than that, is to say that my prior over distributions is going to be one that is basically an exponential of the entropy. Okay, so the more uncertain it is, or minus the entropy. So the more uncertain it is, the less like, um, the more likely it is. A flat distribution, essentially, I'm just going to be saying, is more likely than a very, very peaky, than a specific peaky distribution. The reason being that my expected surprise for a flat distribution would be less than my expected surprise if I were to be seeing um, a samples from a peaky distribution. Okay? Not completely kosher in this v sort of um, uh, broad brush way that I presented the argument, but right now I just want to get reasonableness arguments for why one might adopt this thing called the entropic prior. Because the entropic prior arguably is actually fundamental to everything else we're going to be doing in this course and everything you've ever done in statistical physics. Let's see how. OK, say that you just, um, as another example, in addition to Gaussians and sunsets, sunrises in the morning, and so on and so forth, another example is you come across a system that has n possible states and an energy spectrum. We're now coming full circle to say, how do we do physics when we have uncertainty about things? So here's a situation where we'd love to be doing physics. We've got this particular kind of a situation. And let's say our data, this is a very strange kind of data. Let's say that you actually know the expected energy of the system. What we want to know is that what we're trying to predict is the probability distribution over these possible uh, and possible states. And here is our data that we have. And so what I tell you is that whatever that probability distribution is, this is its expected energy. So that takes the form of a delta function. And to give you a heads up, expected energy is things like temperature. Well, that's the way it's very often interpreted. So this is saying, um, uh, concretely, let's say that you know the temperature of the gas in this room, the air in this room, exactly to infinite precision. OK? So that's your likelihood function. Recall from uh, Bayes' theorem, um, uh, we've got a prior, it's the entropic prior. So Bayes' theorem says that the um, probability, um, this should be a, given a D, I'm sorry. The probability of any distribution conditioned on your data, that should be a D on the right there, is proportional to the delta function times the exponential. Let's try to avoid completely the question of um, what loss function to specify and just assume that the mode of a distribution is a good thing to go after, or alternatively, choose a loss function that's a delta function, then, then any of those kinds of arguments would say that we want to then say, given some data, in this case knowing the average energy of a system, then what I should predict is the probability distribution that is, that's generated, that is consistent with my data, I should choose the uh, distribution that is the MAP, that maximize the distribution with maximal probability given that information. Okay? Look again at what, uh, again, apologies, that's a D, but this is what I want to find the P that maximizes it. So um, uh, can anybody tell me what that answer is? 
What is the P that's going to maximize this? It doesn't matter what alpha is. Yep, because um, uh, we, we are only going to be looking for those distributions. Actually, you jumped two steps. So that's um, two cups of coffee for you. Um, so we know that we're only interested in those. We've got a constraint that we're only interested in those distributions that have the given expected energy. And this is just a dot product constraint, if you'll notice. We want to find, of all the distributions that have that expected energy, which is the one that maximizes the exponential of the entropy? That's the same as saying, which is the one that maximizes the entropy? So what we have right here is a Lagrange multiplier problem. We want to maximize the entropy subject to the constraint on the average value of it. We want to find the distribution that maximizes entropy subject to the constraint on the average value of the energy under that distribution. OK? Boltzmann distribution, canonical ensemble, nothing was said about heat baths or anything like that. Sorry, David. Mm -hmm. So this assumption of uh, the entropic prior, it's essentially saying that the distribution of uh, the entropy is picked uh, around a particular value, which you choose by choosing gamma, because, I mean... Yep, so, but yeah. notice that here the gamma doesn't matter once we go to MAP. Yeah, okay, so, so then, then when you uh, take... And so yep, so maxent, in the sense that it only looks at the peak and does not consider, for example, a quadratic loss or anything like that, Maxent is non-Bayesian. Mm -hmm. People don't like to advertise that. Ed Jaynes, he is some of the things he's most known for, is championing Bayesian statistics and maximum entropy. They actually conflict with one another because he never, he never, Jaynes never actually even talked about it in terms of entropic prior. He never tried to have a Bayesian formulation. There is work to be done. Nobody has done this. Students, if you want a PhD thesis, work to be done on saying, what happens if I adopt an entropic prior, but I want to do a proper Bayes optimal analysis? How does that modify things? For example, we just derived the Boltzmann distribution. And um, let's say that we have a very, very small system. And I'm going to be looking, so we don't have many degrees of freedom, the opposite of the thermodynamic limit. Let's say that rather than doing max cent, you instead want to do a Bayes optimal prediction. How does your prediction for the physics change in small systems if you've got a quadratic loss function or any other loss function? You, the experimentalist, you, the engineer, ultimately, tell me what the loss function is mm -hmm. and how does that actually to change me from going away from a Boltzmann distribution for small systems? Mm -hmm. Nobody's done that. Um, by the way, a quick aside, um, again, this is kind of like career advice um, concerning Ed Jaynes. When he was um, trying to publish his first articles on Bayesian statistics back in the 50s and 60s, that was an era in which the people who, the editors of the major statistics journals, they were all anti-Bayesians. They were all sampling theory statisticians, and this was in the middle of the wars. So he was what's called desk rejected with all of his papers. And then, very famously, um, or at least I think it should be more famously, he was given a rejection in a letter which would said, we are not going to even consider your submission for publication. In fact, we're never going to um, consider any submission you ever send us again. And he took that and put it on a plaque and it was up in his wall. <laughs> OK? So anyway. Humans are humans. Scientists are humans, too, and that's got some unpleasant consequences. So anyway, I think that answers your question. We can do similar things. As we just said, this gives us the canonical ensemble. Just derived it with, in essence, nothing about um, physics in there. Similar reasoning, if what I know is not just the expected energy, but this should be kind of an obvious um, uh, leading question, if I also know the expected number of particles of the state of my system x also gives me an integer value, which is the number of particles. So I know both of those. What do you think we get down here for the answer, for the max ant answer? A 
Come on, come on, come on. Somebody, don't be shy. You get the grand canonical ensemble. All standard statistical physics, equilibrium statistical physics comes, in this sense, straight out of information theory. You don't see this in the textbooks. It's a lot cleaner than what you see in the textbooks. Gurdjieff will be presenting some of what you do see in the textbooks. But there's a very interesting dynamic here. What's going on in, these, in this particular line of reasoning is we have derived equilibrium statistical physics from information theory or from arguments that can be, uh, that are very, very tightly woven into the foundations of information theory. It turns out that if you instead adopt a Bath-based traditional point of view of statistical physics, some of the kind of stuff that Agurja will be presenting, from that in its modern form of stochastic thermodynamics, you actually derive information theory. So here is information theory from which you are deriving statistical physics. If you instead, you can um, adopt a Bath-based formulation and you're going to derive information theory in the sense that many of the quantities that you are going to be forced to calculate are things like mutual information and relative entropy and all of that. So all of the normal quantities in information theory will arrive from the normal Bath-based formalism. So you can actually go either direction from information theory to the statistical physics um, picture, which is consistent with the infinite baths, or with the infinite baths and so on, you're going to be led to calculate all the quantities in information theory. OK, so yes, the grand canonical ensemble. Uh, OK, just to summarize today, um, or this, this first part of it, um, OK, uh, if you have uncertainty, and we always have uncertainty, then there's many different kinds of desiderata that say you should be using probability distributions to just um, discuss that, um, to quantify that uncertainty. If you want to then, um, uh, given, you're given a probability distribution, but now you want to predict a single element, Savage's axioms say you do that with a loss function. This is called the Bayes optimal prediction. Very often the Bayes optimal prediction is well approximated by the MAP. And if you've got a delta function, loss function, they will actually be the same thing. We can do all this for the case where the elements um, that we've got these distributions over are themselves distributions. Um, certainly, that's a straightforward thing to do when we have finite spaces, because then the distribution is just real numbers. So we can have um, all this applied to trying to infer distributions themselves. If your data is a set of delta functions um, about dot products of p of x, um, and you use the entropic prior, what comes out is maxent, and all that is conventional statistical physics. By the way, in addition to go talking about going away from the MAP, um, seeing what happens to statistical physics for when we use the entropic prior, something else, here's a question for you. Um, I don't know where the thermostat is, but if we were to go look at the thermostat right now, It'll have um, probably um, only gets down to, doesn't get anywhere past the dot. It's just got a single digit of precision, OK? All the rest of it is uncertain. In other words, the likelihood function is not a delta function. You can say it's a Gaussian or something like that. So you have actually uncertainty about the temperature of the system. What happens to all the analysis when you have uncertainty about the temperature? Especially because the average, any average of a set of Boltzmann distributions is not a Boltzmann distribution. It's not an exponential. So the actual functional form that comes out when you just build into your analysis the fact that, you know, I'm a little bit unsure about the temperature, nobody's actually worked on that. Moreover, and this is actually a paper that I'm working on with a colleague right now, when you try to take that into account in stochastic thermodynamics, we're saying that we've got an off-equilibrium system where we've got a little bit of uncertainty about the temperature, we've got a little bit of uncertainty about the energy spectrum, we might even have a little bit of uncertainty about the number of baths, and so on and so forth. What happens to the stochastic thermodynamics? Basically, all hell breaks loose, a whole bunch of things break, and so on and so forth. But physicists just pretend that you know the parameters, that your only uncertainty is about the state, that you know all the parameters exactly. That's the standard operating assumption in physics, even though that is never true. 
Okay. So I think I am done at that point. Yep. Um, the blank slide says time to be quiet. Question. Uh, all these results uh, can be obtained also using uh, maximum likelihood. So why do we use to do we have to use uh, the Bayesian framework, which is I think more difficult since we have to impose a prior and because Kolmogorov, because um, Diffinetti said you must use probability theory, and Savage then said um, according to these criteria, we want the Bayes optimal guess. So whether it's difficult or not, that's not really for us to decide. That's God or goddess or whatever is sitting up there in the sky. Um, they decide how, much, how difficult they want life to be for grad students. This is the thing that they decided on the uh, fifth day while they were doing all the other stuff. And they decided that, well, we want life to be um, somewhat challenging. And so, yeah, it's Bayesian statistics. It's not a choice that you have to make. Um, if you want to follow a strategy in which I can Dutch book you, and make money off of you no matter what happens, feel free to violate the axioms of probability theory. If you don't want that, then we're forced to use Bayesian statistics. In particular, if you wanted to derive the canonical ensemble, you can't do that by using maximum likelihood. That's MAP. You need the entropic prior. Otherwise, you're not going to get it. Um, if you were to say that I've got a delta function about the energy of this, of, in this room, and I want to choose a, um, I'm not even sure how you could use that to predict a distribution. It would just be, you would be saying, any distribution that's consistent with the temperature it ha all has the same likelihood. Th because of the nature of your data, there would not be any handle using just the likelihood alone to distinguish among them. Does that answer your question? That was very flip and glib and easy for me to say standing up here. But does that? Yeah, yeah. No, all right. OK. Anything else? Other questions? OK, so maybe we should take um, just a couple of minute break. And then we're going to want to end at 20 of to give enough time for coffee. So probably um, we're not going to go all the way through the uh, next lecture which is the more standard textbook way of deriving statistical physics. Um, but we should, um, should get through um, a whole bunch of it. OK? So just five minutes for everybody. OK. Throwing here? OK. Um, so this is not going to be a big problem for us to, I think, um, just go through this in 20 minutes because we already assume that people have some background in statistical physics and thermodynamics, equilibrium conventional one, okay? So let's go. We are just gonna quickly talk about like this good old statistical physics, like microcanonical, canonical, grand canonical ensemble, and just going to remind you like this fundamental postulates that actually allow us to do conventional statistical physics, such as like the ergodicity assumption and so on and so forth. Um, and sort of after, after this, I'm just going to provide some pointers to like computer science and uh, try to emphasize the differences between like this conventional approach, conventional thermodynamics, and then st stochastic thermodynamics. Okay. So what we want to do actually in, by equilibrium statistical mechanics is to sort of understand. Okay, we have n atoms in a box of volume V, for example. It's like a very like a simple setup, simple setup that you can consider, and it's placed in an arbitrary external potential, any kind of atoms. And you would like to understand the behavior of this kind of a system. How can you formalize the behavior of these particles, right? So one thing that you can do is basically you can write down all the generalized coordinates, such as like ranging from all the position and momenta and so on and so forth, and you can try to solve Newton's equations of motion. But do we able I, I don't know, it, is it feasible to do that? So we want to describe and solve for the behavior of atoms. So, okay, it's, it's not feasible to do that, we know it, because there are far too many particles and so on and so forth. But also there are some other um, questions about, for example, chaotic motion. So that, for example, when we have this kind of a concept, we know that the time evolution depends with ever increasing sensitivity on the initial conditions. So that when, even if you have like some idea about like this initial state, you cannot actually predict the future behavior, right? This is, by the way, this 
can happen independent of molecular chaos. Like it also happens, for example, if you have interesting walls, let's say, of this uh, volume V box, you can have like a cha chaotic behavior even for one particle. This is like something that's studied in quantum chaos. So, and also like the third argument is mostly the strongest argument. We are interested in the typical behavior, okay, of these number of these atoms. So we are trying to average and like we are trying to get the idea of the mean behavior, like the pressure calculations and so on and so forth. So what we are using here, okay, statistical averages. But how do we find statistical averages? So this actually poses a question on how to define some probability distribution, just as, for example, David actually just like, it's the gist of his lecture. So you need to, you have some uncertainty, right? Because we don't know, like, for example, all the momentum and position through like this and this trajectory through the phase space. And you need to use some probability distribution that actually captures what you don't know about the system's behavior. So things that you can do, this is just a verbal statement. In one slide, we're gonna jump to how we state this. So you can either take like this time average of certain degrees of freedom where you take this limit, t, little t to infinity, or you can take an ensemble average of collection of particles. Turns out these two are equal in ergodic systems. So the system kind of self averages. And this is like the thing that actually allows you it, to do statistical physics. If, the, if you don't satisfy this, you, you can't do statistical physics. So yeah, the question was that we need to solve for the behavior of atoms, and we are going to use ensembles for that. So we're talking about ensembles, but how do we actually define ensembles, right? So it comes in this point, the consideration um, of these constraints that we're imposing on the systems, and these constraints are actually going to lead to us to the probability distributions that we use to define these systems or characterize these systems. So for example, let's take like just like this, you know, this um, and atoms in a box kind of a thing in the classical scenario, but also, yeah, we can basically just simply extend it to quantum. But okay, we can write down again, like this position and momenta and these will, all of these points will construct the phase space. If you're not considering, if you're not a mathematician and considering like rigid bodies and so on and so forth, it's always R to the six N. And what, what an ensemble is, simply a probability density function. I don't know if you see my curse, okay. Um, you don't see, I see it, but it's not moving. Anyways, so it's basically a probability density function that is satisfying this, this formula. It makes sense, you need to have, I mean, you're basically summing over all the points in the phase space, right? So, and this is something that represents, again, connecting to the previous lecture, what we do not know about the system, whereas the system itself and its time evolution is encoded in a trajectory that is evolving with time in the phase space, right? So we just say that uh, there is an ergodicity assumption, and it's, we just mathematically express that. This is one thing that I'm emphasizing here, even though it's really trivial for, for many participants, I guess, because this is like this ensemble approach is how we do statistical physics. But tomorrow, starting from tomorrow, we are going to see that in stochastic thermodynamics, we can invoke ensembles, yes, but we can also ascribe quantities like entropy to trajectory level descriptions as well. And this is something that wasn't considered before the advent of stochastic thermodynamics, and this is something really new, okay? So if you want to make some things more specific, we can actually try to ask how we are describing an isolated system. So isolated system is at constant energy and it's like not connected. It's like a whole universe itself and there are no interactions, okay? So one thing that we, we should do is like to express the Hamiltonian as a constant of motion, okay? So the energy is constant in time. And so how we write then, we, not, we need to sort of deduce the probability description, uh, probability distribution that describes the system, right? So we know that this is our like imposition, that the energy is constant. So depending on that, how do we write the probability distribution that defines this ensemble? It's a direct delta function, right? Sorry. So basically, this is, this is the simplest example. And mostly, I mean, to be more precise, just to remind you about it, of course, if you want to be physically or mathematically more precise, we are, we are talking in terms of like energy hypersurfaces, and we are basically saying that if you have n particles in a fixed volume V, and um, the system is kept at constant energy E, we say that there is this uniform probability distribution that describes the system which resides in this hypersurface of like this energy shell, okay? These were the main concepts. 
So one thing that you can do, we did in this class, in, in our like undergrad classes, is basically just to consider now a partition of, of this whole system itself, okay? This was the complete system. And now we're sort of dividing it into two. We know that the total energy is constant, right? And because energy is an extensive quantity, we can basically write it as a sum of this, you know, partition A. I'm sorry about that. It's not E1, E2, but yeah, okay, I changed it, notation. So basically we can write it as this sort of like the energy of the components, okay? So, um, and also one thing, one other thing that we did was to express all this, you know, like this, let's say, phase space or the part of the phase space of the whole system um, as a Cartesian product of its components, like the sigma A, uh, sorry, omega A times omega B. So based on that, we don't like products, we like sums and so on and so forth. And depending on so many other motivations, we are not going to go into that. This was how we, uh, this is how we write the Boltzmann entropy, right? And itself is also an extensive, um, extensive quantity. So, uh, yeah, one of the things that we can do with this kind of a quantity is basically just take the derivatives and just sort of recover the conventional thermodynamic quantities. For example, um, just checking that, okay, everyone knows it, I think, but yeah, okay, so for example, this is something that gives us what the inverse temperature, right? And so on and so forth. So you can, we know that, for example, this S is encoded in terms of V and E, this macroscopic variables. And if you take some different derivatives, like with respect to V, you're recovering pressure and so on and so forth. Okay, that's good, that's great. And also these are like the first and second law of thermodynamics. You can, I mean, if we just consider this expression on the like down right hand side and take the derivatives, you see that on the other, um, I mean, in the opposite way, you can basically recover that um, expressions of microcanonical ensemble. So that's good, but microcanonical ensemble is sort of boring because nothing is really isolated. We actually want to investigate some systems, closed systems, that are kept in thermal equilibrium. How do we keep them in thermal equilibrium? We imagine a universe that is like partitioned into a system of interest and the bat reservoir, which is this is like the important point. It's an infinite, infinite idealized system, okay? So it is basically sort of dictating this temperature, deciding the temperature of the system of interest. And now we're asking the question of what is the equilibrium probability distribution function that actually characterizes this system, okay? So yeah, here we go. It's the Boltzmann distribution. And so um, actually David pointed it out. There are like so many different ways to derive this Boltzmann distribution. But yeah, one of the most, I think, attractive ways is to use this kind of like the um, optimization problem that was considered in David's lecture is like just use Lagrange multipliers and even without physical considerations you can actually find this one and yeah one of the important things central to the theory of like this equilibrium statistical physics is like the partition function which has this form basically um, this h to the 3n is something that I added to um, emphasize the like the unit cell of the phase space but it's not important um, and then, um, building on this, um, basically, you can recover, for example, take the logarithm of this um, ln z and take the derivatives over it, and you still recover the thermodynamic quantities. Okay, so for example, one of the things that you can do is like to compute like this mean internal energy. We know this. I'm passing this. Okay, and then um, time. Can I learn? I mean, 10 minutes pass probably, right? Okay, that's great. You said you gave me 20 minutes. That's why I'm <laughs> rushing. But okay, so then I can just stop for 30 seconds, but just make sure that, I mean, you know this, right? You know the subject. Perfect. Okay, yeah. If, if you want to remember things, just like two books, Lambda Lipschitz, Setna, done. I mean, yeah. That's good. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, but if we want to consider a, like a really thermodynamically open system, we need to not only consider energy exchanges, but also the matter exchange, right? So that we want our system to also have particle, um, you know, we want our system to also exchange particles. How do we do that? We are introducing sort of a new constant of motion that would allow us to um, investigate the system still at equilibrium, and this is the chemical potential. And we write down the grand canonical ensemble probability distribution in this form. So now we have a different, like this chemical potential also. Okay? So now the question what if we perturb the system? 
what happens then? Because we are always assuming that, I mean, in equilibrium statistical physics, I think it doesn't hurt to say that this little t, time, notion of time, it actually doesn't really exist. You're always averaging and your averages are like time independent, but things start to become interesting and enriched if you actually consider that there is an external agent that is perturbing the system, that is taking the system out of equilibrium and introducing time dependency. What happens then? We are asking questions along the lines of, for example, how does a system relax back to equilibrium? Or if it doesn't relax to equilibrium, how does it do it? So up until 90s, and I think it's also safe to say just like 21st century, yeah, um, I don't know, 2000, um, it was the case that non-equilibrium thermodynamics tried to tackle this kind of a question, and it actually developed really impressive tools. But it, I mean, this tools mostly worked for small perturbations, and it's like under the roof of something called linear response theory. And you could, yeah, a lot, you know, you could derive expressions for like thermodynamic expressions that would be, you know, that would consistently describe what's happening to these systems if you just apply small deviations, like small external fields. But beyond this linear response regime, nothing. Non-equilibrium thermodynamics really didn't say so many interesting things. Because if I perturb a system and I take it like arbitrarily far from equilibrium, no framework to describe it. But then, stochastic thermodynamics. So what stochastic thermodynamics does is basically, it uses statistical mechanics, okay? It uses statistical mechanics to provide the rigorous foundation to non-equilibrium physics which is applicable to systems arbitrarily far from equilibrium. And again, the dynamics are still governed by equilibrium reservoirs and so on and so forth. But now this time, this whole framework of equilibrium thermodynamics, it can also be recovered by just like mm, stochastic thermodynamics and also the non-equilibrium thermodynamics. It's captured by stochastic thermodynamics. Of course, it's not like this holy, holy, holy thing, holy structure, like this knowledge of body, body of knowledge, but still um, it does a lot. So just a few points. So tomorrow, David is going to introduce how we formalize, okay, stochastic thermodynamics. We all talked about it, but, you know, there's, like, mathematical basis of stochastic thermodynamics. Before going into that, I just wanted to provide an intuition for stochastic thermodynamics. So we mostly use stochastic thermodynamics to understand mesoscopic systems and their time evolution, and you can take mesoscopic systems to be defined as like, if you have a delta E around this KBT value, then yeah, it's probably applicable. You can use stochastic thermodynamics. But of course, these systems are dynamical systems, right? And they need a dynamical description of how they evolve in time. So two things that you can do. You're, gonna pro you're going to provide a stochastic description. Okay, this is the conventional stochastic thermodynamics that uses actually, for example, the continuous time Markov chains, jump processes, like, um, all the things that, that we describe by, for example, things like master equations. If you don't know how to write down a master equation, maybe just look at it before tomorrow's lecture. We are going to start from there. And the other thing that you can do is to, again, take a deterministic description. What you're doing is actually kind of resembling what we did in, for example, microcanonical ensemble or in the other ones, where we take a universe and then partition it into a system and a reservoir. So one thing that is interesting is that I think 90% of the work in the, at least classical system stochastic thermodynamics is considered with the stochastic description because it makes sense, right? Because you're considering mesoscopic systems and they're sort of um, exposed to fluctuations and so on and so forth. But in this course, um, I think, yeah, it's, it's rare to do it. We're also going to talk about this deterministic description. This A, the first one, it considers infinite paths, okay? Uh, that dictate the dynamics, stochastic dynamics over the systems. And the B, you can also consider finite paths. So in, with, with this deterministic description of finite path formalism that we are going to discuss, bad states are actually also important, in a sense. So yeah, we also emphasize that still how we are going to drive stochastic thermodynamics. Yeah, it's, it's formulated by conventional statistical mechanics requirements. We are going to use probability distributions, but they are going to have different meanings right now. And again, we are going to use reservoirs, infinite, finite, mostly infinite. 
And the one thing that is beautiful is that these thermodynamic descriptions, they won't explicitly involve dynamics, okay? They won't be really complicated, complex, messy things. They will be really clean. And they will have, for example, interesting connections to what we just talked about, like the Shannon entropy. Shannon entropy is like the en entropy, this expression that we're using in stochastic thermodynamics. And we are going to, I think, understand tomorrow better why it makes sense to use it. So three more points. Um, three, I think, major contributions of stochastic thermodynamics. This is something that I wanted to emphasize before going into the mathematics tomorrow because it's just, yeah, it's, it's going to be, I think, just like a fast, like a ramp. So finally, uh, we can talk about the definition of thermodynamic quantities in a consistent way for systems that are stochastic and fluctuating. This is something that, that we weren't able to do before that. And the second one, I think it's really interesting, is that so since Boltzmann's time, we had this sort of complicacy about the foundations of thermodynamic irreversibility, right? Like the error of time pr paradox. It's also going by the name of Loschmidt's paradox. So for example, this finite path um, formalism actually provides some understanding to irreversibility, okay? And the error of time. I think this is really important, but I, I'm also not saying this is as Gurdjie as myself, but I'm also saying this as a TA, because um, this is basically, we are going to touch upon how we actually recover stochastic description from deterministic description in stochastic thermodynamics, okay? And also, the third point is information is physical. Uh, we know actually how to, you know, what is like a thermodynamic cost to do some computational operations beyond bit erasure. This point is important because I think this is one of the rare courses that are given on stochastic thermodynamics and computation, okay? So finally, uh, one more thing is that I think just to raise your appetite for stochastic thermodynamics, it's gonna take 45 minutes and then I'm done with an announcement, is that we're gonna see after this introduction to stochastic thermodynamics tomorrow, we are gonna be talking about thermodynamic uncertainty relations and so on and so forth which are basically providing bounds on the precision of physical observables in terms of the entropy production or the dissipation, okay? So these kind of bounds, actually, they exist in stochastic thermodynamics. They are applicable in a wide range of scenarios. They have limits, and we must be aware of its limits. So they are not applicable to, I don't know, any kind of interesting system. So we must be aware of it. But still, they work quite well. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to emphasize is that I think this is a really interesting point. This is on the computation side. So these kind of universal bonds, the energetic bonds, they're kind of pointing out in the direction of that, uh, direction that, okay, we need to consider what we can do physically, energetically, okay? So it, there are energetic constraints on what is physically allowable or not for any kind of a physical phenomenon that you, you can consider from the stochastic thermodynamics perspective. So one really relevant question is actually posed by computer science in the computational complexity theory. And it's also kind of touching the foundations of mathematics. What do we mean when we say a problem is solvable? And if I give you a computational setup, can you solve that problem? And how efficiently you can solve that problem? And so since I think 60s or 70s, um, computer scientists and physicists sort of tried to combine these two questions, like what is physically allowable or efficient, to the question of what is computationally allowed or like efficient by using statistical physics, good old statistical physics, okay? If you know about it, like spin glass systems and so on and so forth, again, another reference to Parisi. So um, they, kinda try, they tried to come up with um, some measures of like statistical physics measures to quantify computational complexity. But these kind of things, almost all of them, they include, for example, mappings to easing models and so on and so forth, and they are rather static. They're not actually talking about computing or problem solving as a dynamic process. They're just modeling everything as a static process. So we need to, I think, from a pedagogical perspective, just during this whole course, we need to keep in mind that what it means to physically compute, and can we actually relate the physical trade-offs of stochastic thermodynamics that relate the speed of a computation or speed of a process, thermodynamic process, 
its noise level and whether the computational system is tailored to perform a given computational task to abstract limits of computer science that are imposed that are like in detail investigated in computational complexity theory in terms of descriptive complexity or resource com complexity such as like memory and like um, you know time constraints and complexities so this is everything so one thing um, today I'm going to post the homework and it's going to include about like five questions but one of them is just about the information theory and sort of like you're going to work with Markov chains um, and entropy rates because it's the most related topic, I think, to like the stochastic thermodynamics and CGMCs. And the other four of them, they are going to cover the topics that we are going to be introduced this week. But um, so I'm not sure um, if it's going to be super um, meaningful to ask for the you know, for, for your solutions, like, on Friday. So I think you can send out them to me until, I don't know, if that's also okay with you. Maybe until, like, Sunday or something like that. Okay? So, yeah. Uh, but on this topic, one more, one more thing is that um, if you want any kind of, like, recitation hours or something like that, also for people on Zoom, if you want me to solve problems, on, on board or on just like by using these kind of slides, um, I can do that and I think I should do that. And also based on that, this was something that we discussed with Matteo, depending on how this course evolves, depending on like, I don't know how much you like stochastic thermodynamics and computation and so on and so forth. Um, I think it would be great to just sort of come up as they do in Les Oceans and so on and so forth, like these summer schools in a traditional sense. If you can come up with lecture notes and just like, you know, just, pro, just to provide a perspective and so on and so forth, um, maybe we can, as a, as a group of people, can do that and just, just collaborate with ICTP on this. So this is another really pedagogical thing. So we can actually talk about, for example, open research problems and so on and so forth. And I think our mentors and professors here, they can actually guide us through this. So yeah, I'm going to send a questionnaire to Slack if you want to do recitations and discussion hours so that we will specify some available times. And that's all from me. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we have free coffees upstairs. And uh, um, you should